Did you enjoy last week when we started to explore the book of Hebrews and the introduction? This week, we're continuing on the book of Hebrews. And for those who are new to this, we're going to be exploring, a, in addition to last week, a few of the rabbinic approaches to, in, to interpreting writings. So if you were living in or around Israel, you would have written and communicated in a certain way. I'm going to do my very best today as we go through Hebrews chapter 1 to explain some of those. And what by the time we get to Hebrews 12, 13, and 14, I think you're going to be experts at picking apart line by line what rabbinic uh, dissertation style or thought process is going on in the writer's head. And there are eight different styles that I can identify, eight different, and, and by the way, for a Jewish writer, this is probably normal. For us writing in English, especially Aussie English, we have ways of writing. You go to university, you learn to write in an academic style, and all of a sudden, those reading have to get in the academic mind to read it. Do you, you know what I mean? You, you, do you understand what I say? You know, you read a newspaper, and you can sort of skim every third line because you sort of know the rubbish that you read. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. But how you read this document determines what you understand from the document. This undoubtedly, last week we talked about who, who is this uh, written to, why was it written, what was the context of right, what was the document itself. And so just to recap on it, the what was that the book of Hebrews is an exhortation. So contrasted to the other epistles, it's, this document is an exhortation. It has all of the characteristics of some of the other epistles, but it's an encouragement. It was written possibly, and we, we think it was written prior to 70 AD, because it uses language around the temple as if it's still standing. Now, we know in 70 AD what happened? The temple is destroyed. So it would be a little redundant for this writing of Hebrews to be done after 70 AD using temple language should the temple have still been standing. We're unsure about who had written it, but many believe Clement or Priscilla, to whom the Messianic Jews of Judea. Now, many of us as Christians, we've interpreted the book of Hebrews being to those Jews outside of the diaspora, but this is a letter concerning to the Jewish, Messianic, Jewish, Jesus-believing Jews in Judea. And why? Because many of them had been excluded from the temple because of their faith. And so this book offers us a very unique opportunity, okay? We've been on the auction route earlier today. But this offers us a very unique opportunity to sit and learn as if we're sitting in a first-century synagogue. Okay, and I want you to try and come with me and put your, you know, that's where we are. Now, I'm not a rabbi. The book is going to speak like the, the Jewish writer. But we're going to sit and try and together put our heads into gear as if we're listening to this person or writing their letter. And some of us will think, what is he doing? What is he saying? But with the tools we're going to use today, I'm hoping that you can start to analyze this and come to some of the same conclusions that I have. I promise you one thing. I haven't got the book of Hebrews 100% accurate. I, I don't think any of us could, although Pastor Greg's probably got a lot closer than I have. Alan, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Midrash Al. <laughs> Fraser, Pastor Fraser Harding, he's probably got. But if any of us have got it 100% correct, I would be surprised. But we're going to do our very best to interpret it. The author of Hebrews presents this argument with a style that can feel quite different from the linear way that you and I often think. Okay, we often, we'll often take one of these approaches to a sermon, to a teaching, to a lecture, and we'll use one of them. But in rabbinic thought, they'll take eight different processes and shove it into the one <laughs> bit of writing. It, it's, a, it's a journey. It's, it's a divergent journey. These guys think on tangents. They use in the same uh, lot of passage of Scripture. They'll use the straightforward meaning, you know, like murder is murder. And at the same time, then they'll, they'll dance around another topic which is related to another topic from another scripture somewhere else. And you, ha you have to sort of know when is he speaking or when is she speaking, literally, figuratively, allegorically, and which of these eight are they, ref are they referring. So are you happy to go on that journey with me? Great. So last week we covered, and I'm going to start here. I'm going to go through the eight styles, and then we're going to jump into Hebrews 1. Uh, last week I covered a term called uh, kal vulchomer. Do you remember that one? Does anyone remember what that was? Helen, can you tell us quickly? Light to heavy, yes. An argument from a lesser to the greater. 
And so the example we have is in Hebrews 2 verses 23. Uh, Dean, you can bring these up if you want. You don't have to. Uh, Hebrews 2, 20, 2 verses 2 to 3. For if the message spoken through angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? So it puts in contrast uh, the law given by the angels and how binding it was and what will happen if someone's disobedient to it. And then what about those who then get saved by grace and are then disobedient to the word of God? How much greater the punishment? Can you see the contrast? A lesser. Now, the lesser has to be true, by the way. The law has to come from the messengers. It has to be accepted. There must be judgment on it, righteous and and, uh, unrighteous. We know that's true. Therefore, the greater of salvation is also true, that God punishes the wicked and he honors and blesses the righteous. Everyone okay with that? You're good, especially those who are saved by their faith. Um, Another example, I'm going to just skip over these, is Matthew 12, just in case you want a proof of text that I'm not making this up for the book of Hebrews, Jesus and the other apostles use, use this language frequently. Matthew 12, verses 11 and 12, he said to them, if you have one sheep, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So if it's permissible for me to help a sheep, which is true, I can do that on the Sabbath, how much more is it permissible to help a person or save life? You with me? So this is this, they'll always draw these parallels. And we in our uh, Western brain, Greek brain, whatever you like to call it, sometimes we contrast the comparison, eliminating the other. We can save a life, but we're not going to save the sheep. That's, that's not what we'll do. Or we look at the new covenant, which is, which is using this form, and then we cancel the old covenant. That's not how this works. The Australian equivalent is, <laughs> I used it last week on stage, but uh, if a child can carry a small backpack, then a grown adult can certainly carry a backpack too. Fair? The true and the heavy one. The second one we're going to look at is called Gezerah Shavah. Okay, it's linking two verses with a common word or phrase. Now, you might have noticed this. Have you ever listened to biblical commentators? And they've, with the biblical commentators, especially uh, Christian ones, they've got like the law of first mention. Have you heard of that? You know, or, or you've got um, where it's said two times or three times. Have you, have you heard of that? So we, we do this too, by the way. As Christians, we develop our own uh, ways of interpreting Scripture, and it's quite fun, but it doesn't necessarily make it correct, okay? You know, uh, a lot of the, our writers use, uh, what, what's the one, Dad? I'm just thinking, of, is it's like a, in Psalms. Is it an, it's not an anagram, is it? Uh, Psalms 119. Uh, if it was in English... In the alphabet, A, B, C, D, each verse starts off with a... To, Tobias will know that and he'll, he'll, like, he'll, he'll let me know, I'm sure. But uh, Gezer Shavar, moving on, uh, <laughs> is linking two verses with a common word or phrase. So the example in Hebrews is Hebrews 4, verses 3, and it says, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. Now, do you notice the use of the word rest twice? Rest and rest. Now, again, as Christians, we take that to mean that many of us take that to mean that the Sabbath day has therefore been cancelled because a greater rest awaits those who are, are saved. But that's not, that's not what the author was doing. He's creating a link. This is a fairly common rabbinic way of writing. He's creating a link between the words rest and rest so that we'd understand that the messianic age, which this is what Jesus is talking about, the age of his rule and reign, is like that seventh-day rest when the Lord took it after creation. Uh, An Australian equivalent would be, imagine we're reading about two different beach safety rules. You ever been to Burley Beach and there's been a red flag up? Yeah? Or, Or you've seen a red flag on a beach? At Burley Beach, a red flag means a risk of high currents. At Bondi Beach, down south, a red flag means the beach is closed. Now, we can draw the same conclusion from the word red flag. And I know if I say, look, I've got a red flag about that person over there, Leon's going to go and boot them out. Is that right? No, no, that's not going to happen. But we know the word red flag, don't we? Red flag, caution. All we're doing is we're applying this principle of connecting this this principle with this word that we see twice. The third is called binyan av. 
and it's establishing a general principle based on one or more specific cases. So in Hebrews 7 verses 11 to 17, if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, why was there still need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron? So the specific case of Melchizedek's priesthood is used to establish the principle of a superior eternal priesthood, not the cancelling of the former. You've got, to, you've got to understand that in this, there's very little contrast to eliminate. There's a lot of compare to complement. There's a difference. The spe- uh, and then in Luke 13, verses 15, another example, the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give water? Then should you not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? So, Again, he's drawing like that kovul chomer. It's a lighter and heavier comparison. Then we have uh, what's known as the kovul chomer mufne, which is like the, you ever, we as Aussies are good at this. You know, how are you going? Not bad. We use the negative, don't we? Right? Any other examples of where we use the negative as a good? Awfully good. It's sick. Meaning good. Right. Any other examples you can think of? We, we, we're good at this. So Aussies seem to be good at this. We, if there was one that speaks to us, it's this one here. It's the Kovokomo, but it's the uh, negative version. And, it's, and they describe it as an unnecessary or redundant argument, emphasizing the strength. So Hebrews 10 verses 28 to 29 says, So anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? So it's, it's the lighter to heavy argument, but it's in a negative sense. Um, If violating the law of Moses leads to death, how much more severe is the punishment for rejecting the Son of God? Australian equivalent is if you wouldn't leave your pet dog outside in the cold, you certainly wouldn't leave your child outside too. We then have number five, which is remez, which is a hint at a deeper meaning. In Hebrews 8 verses 5, they serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. Again, not a cancellation, not a replacement, but it hints at a deeper meaning. This is often used to try and draw a person in. This is like clickbait, okay? Clickbait, newsline heading, gets you to go in and read deeper into it. Uh, We would do so as a preacher's uh, uh, using a story like Anzac Day to convey something about mateship. And then it would bring out the point. There's a hint at a deeper meaning that's applicable using often a story. We then have Darash, which is seeking a deeper meaning, often through allegory or typology. Now, again, you guys can write these down. You can take pictures of them, whatever you need, or you can ask me for a copy of these slides. I will send them to you. But I want you to just get in the habit of seeing these words and then trying to evaluate what the verse is out of these eight. I know that's a lot, but... You are Bereans, you you love studying the Word of God and the Scripture, and this is a text that's not in our common language or understanding. So an example of Darash in Hebrews is Hebrews 3 verses 7. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. And of course, we know the rebellion is talking about in the time of the... um, the wilderness, the 40 years, this is, not the re- this is not a rebellion that anyone whom Jesus is talking to would have been alive to experience. They weren't part of that rebellion, and yet there's an allegory and connection there going back to that time. We then have Peshat, and that is the straightforward literal interpretation. Now, the rabbinic approach of reading Scripture follows a bit of a process. If you were a disciple of a rabbi the rabbi would take you and say, I want you to understand the scripture in the Peshat way, the literal, straightforward way. Get a good understanding of the Peshat before you move on to the next layer or the next layer. So the next layer is the allegorical, and then eventually the fourth layer is the mystical. We as Christians, we often, we want to jump straight into the mystical, don't we? Yeah, true. You know, many of us who might uh, consider ourselves Pentecostals. I love the, the, the idea that sometimes people think of us as swinging from the chandeliers. Um, you know, every faith has its version of that. Uh, there's nothing particularly wrong with the mystical as long as it's grounded first on the, fa- the face value literal. 
It has to be grounded. Okay? You can't have a house that's three stories tall that's not built on cement. It'll crumble and crash. The cement is the Peshat version of the Torah. You know, there's a rabbi, his name's Rashi. Who's heard of Rashi? He's one of the Peshat writers. Quite often he doesn't, he won't always talk about things in an allegorical or mystical manner. You'll get a very straightforward interpretation. That's why we like a lot of Rashi's writings. If you want to start reading a rabbi, he's a good one uh, to read. We then have Midrash, Midrash Al. The Midrash is a homiletic interpretation that draws moral or theological lessons. Sorry, I didn't use the example. Uh, in the Peshat version in Hebrews 9 verses 22 says, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. So we don't need to interpret that any other way. It's matter of fact. It's straightforward. Uh, Exodus 20 verses 13. You shall not murder. Does anyone have a, you know, we don't need to get more allegorical on that. Although our Messiah does. He brings a midrash on it and uh, it's possibly another form as well where he starts to talk about how hatred towards your brother is murdering your heart. Midrash, homiletic interpretation, drawing moral or theological lessons often through commentary. The midrash is often used to fence the Torah or bring about an understanding of how something applies. So in Hebrews 11, by faith Abraham, when he was called to go to a place, he would later receive as his inheritance, and he obeyed and went. So we see that the chapter draws lessons from the lives of the, of the patriarchs to bring something in the present day. You ever heard someone say, I want, to, I want someone to preach a message that's relevant? Have you ever heard that before? They want the midrash. That's what they want. They want the story and then the application to their lives. And it, we love the midrash, don't we? The rabbis particularly have great fun with the Midrash, a bunch of guys talking about a story and, and bring such light to it. All right. You ready to go to Hebrews 1? It's all to get to this point, and we're going to get there. Open your Bibles up to Hebrews chapter 1 with me. And if you recognize one of those eight, I want you to shout it out, okay? Just, just give it a go. We're going to get used to this. By the end of it, you'll probably have a, your Bible scribbled, I'm hoping, with these, these different styles next to it. So Hebrews chapter 1. Let's go. Long ago, and by the way, this is going to be expositional preaching. So for some of you, you're going to love this. And others of you, you might, you might find this a little bit drawn out because we're going just through scripture, line by line, scripture by scripture. But really, we're going to get something solid out of this. Chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. So we're reading here that God's revealing how he has spoken. It's very, this one's very straightforward. Peshat, we've got a Peshat. Yes, there's one other in here as well that you can take. And sometimes there's a bit of crossover. And there's a favorite, by the way, that this author likes to use. If you recognize the favorite, his or her favorite, I want you to, you know, as we journey on, just note that down. So this first verse reveals how God speaks and his methods. God spoke through the writers of the Bible or what we would call, many of us would call the Old Testament. And those scriptures are actually referred to uh, the, as the Hebrew scriptures or the Tanakh. Has anyone heard that word before? You've heard that word. Uh, can anyone tell me what the word Tanakh is made up from? It's not a standalone word. It's, it's made up of three different parts. Who can tell me what the word Tanakh is made up? It's behind me. So, so really all of you. Uh, without excuse. Thanks, Dean. Uh, <clears throat> so Tanakh, we have T is for the Torah. It's God's instructions. Most uh, would, would refer to that as the law, but the Torah is a lot broader than just the law. It is God's instructions. It is his way. It is the path. It is the living righteously in the kingdom of God. And in it, it does have statutes. It does have commands. But Think of the Torah not as legislative law alone, but how a father might treat a child on how to live and how to grow up in a good household. Think of the Torah like that. It'll change how you view God's word. A father never sets out, a good father never sets out to continually punish their children, but to bring discipline in order that they might grow up as respectable men and women in this world. So too, the Lord has his instructions for how his children should live. And as a good, good father, he tries to guide us and correct us and lead us on that path. Now, when we're disobedient to that path, there's a word we use called sin. 
the Hebrew word for it is chata, which means missing the mark. Torah means to hit the mark or find the way to the mark. Sin is to miss the mark. So when we are following God's ways, instructions, his Torah, we're hitting the mark where he wants us to go. Sin is everything and anything that misses that mark. We then have the prophets, the Nevi'im. Now, your Bible, depending on what version you have, will have a different collection of prophets compared to the uh, Hebrew Bible. For example, when we say the prophets, they're often in Hebrew thought they believe that the patriarchs, Moses, they were, they were the greatest prophets, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, along then with some of the others. We then have K for Ketuvim, which is the writings. So when the writers of Hebrews is referring to God spoke by the prophets and then through the Torah and our fathers, he's referring to very specifically what collection of writings? The Torah. No, no, not the Torah, the Tanakh. He's referring to the Tanakh. So the, at this point, there is no New Testament, is there? There's no, there's no writings, uh, other writings that are in existence. This is predominantly referring, he's referring to the holy scriptures that was the Tanakh. Even when James says the scripture is used for dot, 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 at that point there wasn't a great collection of writings. The scriptures being referred to was the Tanakh. And so we as Christians have to, we have to get through our mind that the world has done a great job at trying to eliminate that first half that we called Old Testament, and yet most of the commentary from our apostles in what we call the New Testament actually endorses them as the Holy Scriptures. So we have to have a bit of a shift. I don't like calling it the Old Testament. I love calling it the Tanakh because, you know, I don't know, maybe it's just me. Old sounds redundant. New sounds better and more exciting. But the, the good thing is the Old Testament is really the foundation that everything of the house of our faith is built upon. And if we don't have it, we have the sandy house. By the way, John 1.1 says that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you want an example, we're going to see it in a moment, that Jesus is the living Torah, and the Torah was spoken by Jesus, then you cannot separate the Torah and Jesus. It is Him. It was Him. It was spoken by Him. So in Jewish tradition, the prophets are seen as the mouthpiece of God, often bringing a word during pivotal moment. And we see that this uh, verse sets the stage by showing the continuity of God's commu communication from the Tanakh and then through to Jesus. So now this is important because now anything that Jesus says holds great gravity equal to everything holy that has come before. So this is a... Uh, positioning statement. Verse 2, but in these last days he spoke to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, but through whom he also created the world. We touched on that a little bit. Can anyone give me an example of what type of uh, interpretation that was, rabbinic interpretation? Light to heavy. Okay, okay, great. Who else would agree light to heavy? Okay, we got we. It's all right. We we mixed consensus is okay. This just shows us that we're going, we're just getting our heads into gear. You know, all of us are sitting in neutral at the moment, but in a few weeks' time, we're going to be first, second, third, fourth, fifth together. All right. It's midrash. Okay. Cool. No, no. I'm 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 interested in what you think, Helen. It's great. He spoke to us by his son. So unlike the fragmented and varied revelations that we have through the prophets and some which are still to be fulfilled, when Jesus speaks, we've got great clarity about our role and responsibilities on this earth. Whom he appointed the heir of all things. The appointment of the son as the heir aligns with um, what we would call the Jewish tradition of the firstborn. The firstborn receives a great inheritance. But that great inheritance is not that that just gets blown and, uh, and, and spent like the story of the prodigal son. It, you don't just blow the money. That money as, as, as the firstborn is so that you can look after the rest of the family in the father's absence. And we see many a parable in the scripture about how the father goes away or there's a responsibility given to a firstborn. There's also another child named as a, known as a firstborn and that is a, a nation called Israel. And those who are Gentiles, many of us in this room, are, are there any uh, Jews in here today, Jewish people in this room? No, okay, so oh, that we, we do, yes. So for most of us, we are the younger brother to an older brother who's been given an inheritance to look after us. And really, 
Israel has done a great job. If you're sitting in this room saved by grace through faith because of a firstborn named Jesus, that's a pretty good job. That's a pretty good job. He created the world. The son is not only the heir, but he's the agent of creation. Now, again, I'm, I'm having, thank you, Teresa. I have to go into a little bit of mystic tradition here. But in Proverbs 3 verses 9, 19, and we see that the logos, the word theology in John 1, 1, 3 supports portraying the son as the divine creator. He is the word. He was the word. He's the Torah. We talked about that before. And so when they're saying in these last days, uh, I'm not going to get into a great deal of eschatology today because we, we're not going to tr- touch on pre-trib rapture, post-trib rapture. We're not going to talk about that. But I will talk about this, that it says in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, which means that the Jewish expectation of Messiah is that they believed that he was coming today. They experienced a form of the book of Revelation before we've seen the book of Revelation. They've experienced most of what's recorded in there already once. There has been an abomination of desolation. There has been a scattering. There has been a great tribulation. There has been an incredible exile. Most of what we read in Revelation has in fact actually happened at least once. And so the writer says in these last days, believing truthfully that they're waiting ready for Messiah to come and start the thousand year reign on this earth. But that's not to say that our attitude should be any different. Our attitude should be, we expect him. What days are we in? The last days. If he doesn't come in our generation, what generation are they going to be living in? The last days. And if he doesn't come for another thousand years, when will they be living? The last days. So we are in the last days as much as that was true back then. Verse 3. And I have 14 verses. Ten weeks became 20. Thanks, Leon. <clears throat> we'll see how we go. I don't want to rush this, but let's, let's just see how we go. You okay with that? Yeah? Good. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he is the radiance of the glory of God. So Jesus is described, when you picture Jesus, he's described as this visible manifestation of God's glory. We've talked about this on the Torah portion many a time where we've talked about the Shekinah or Shekinah glory. Have you heard that term before? The Shekinah that was in the temple, that exuded out of the temple, this wonderful presence of God, this wonderful light that could had the power to absolutely obliterate you. And Jesus is referred to in comparison as this radiant glory. His presence in the in the uh, it's in the book of Solomon or wisdom of Solomon 726. It describes wisdom, often who we parallel with Jesus or the Messiah, as a reflection of eternal light, a spotless mirror of the working of God and image of his goodness. So when Jesus is on this earth, what we're talking about is his glory, his Shekinah, the wonderful presence, manifestation of God. This whole first chapter, by the way, is a setup on the character of Jesus to establish his authority so that when we look at the rest of the book, we'll understand. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. So this statement here attributes the sustaining power of Jesus and again, in the wisdom of Solomon 7, 24 to 25, it describes wisdom as more mobile than any motion because of her pureness, she pervades and penetrates all things. And so if wisdom indeed is part of Jesus or the spirit of Jesus, everything is held together by him. He makes purification for us. Jesus' sacrificial death is then likened to the purification rituals of the Aaronic priesthood. His death and resurrection accomplish the ultimate purification, but faith is the engager or the action for this. This, again, is not eliminating the Levitical priesthood because while there is heaven, while there is day and night, there is a Levitical covenant, there is an Aaronic covenant, there are covenants with Israel that must remain up until uh, the end. I was talking with someone the other day about this. They said, um, you know, has the church replaced Israel? Has anyone heard that argument before? 
And the great quote, the great scripture gets used, for there is neither male nor female, well, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. You heard that one? Okay, now, now, big argument with this one. If there is neither Jew nor Gentile, did we suddenly stop becoming male and female? Did, did we suddenly stop having employers and employees or slaves and masters? No, none of that has happened because we're, this, this book, this scripture that we're looking at is both now by faith but not yet in reality. We have to engage our minds in the now by faith but not yet by reality. If I ask you the question, are you born again? You'll say, yes, I am. And I'll say, yes, you are by faith but not yet in reality. Because there comes a time where by faith you are born again, but in reality that happens as Jesus returns and your spirit comes out of Sheol, out of paradise. It collides with your body and you are now born again of the spirit. Not yet or now but not yet. The one new man is the resurrected person. And at that point there will be neither male nor female, slave nor master, and there'll be neither Jew nor Gentile. You'll be one new man. By faith now, not yet in reality. How's everyone going? Good? I might do one more, and then I'm thinking I'll pull up for today so that you can process all of this and we can keep going on this journey. Is that all right? We've covered those eight, and maybe it'll take some time for us to go over them again. <clears throat> Thank you. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So here the writer of Hebrews is using language that darts all over the scripture. And this is one of the Binyan of uh, versions. And it says here in Psalms 110, The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion. You will rule in the midst of your em enemies. And so here we see this positioning of Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father, which fulfills Psalm, Psalms 110, but was revealed by Psalms 110 that this is how the Son of God or the Messiah would sit. It also says in Psalms 110, the Lord shall say to my Lord, or the Lord God will say to God. That's one of the great examples we see of the Son of God not actually being just the Son, but actually God himself in his deity. Having become much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Again, this is now a positioning statement. Who is this Jesus? Is he a prophet? Is he an angel? Is he just a messenger? Who is he? Who is he? He's God in the flesh. Why do they need to know this? If they've been excluded from the temple and they're no longer, these Messianic Jews, these Messiah-believing Jews are no longer able to now bring their sacrifices, worship at the temple, as was their daily practice, which was their great daily practice. They loved doing that. It, it, it is scriptural for the Jewish people to make sacrifices at the temple. It's not been replaced. It's not actually been done away with. Just because the destruction of the temple doesn't mean that it's got, when, when the temple is rebuilt, guess what's going to return? Well, yeah, Jesus, not <laughs> that, that was a good one. But what, what else is going to return? Sacrifices. Now, this one will often make us as Christians flare up a little bit. We say, hang on, wasn't Jesus death once and for all? But this is because of how we read the book of Hebrews. If God has an eternal covenant with the, Abra with the Aaronic priesthood and the Levitical priesthood, and he has a covenant that he's going to recreate or reestablish the temple, and Isaiah 56 tells us that as he returns, they'll make sacrifices again in the temple. When he's reigning on this earth, it means the sacrifices are going to continue. But we've seemed to somehow excluded the idea of sacrifices. We've, we've made redundant sacrifices through what we believe about the book of Hebrews. We'll get to that. Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So having become as much superior to angels... The statement is signifying a, tr a transition from the discussion of the son's divine nature to his exalted status. The term become, which is genominus, suggests that a process that culminated to his current exalted state. So he went from one state to another state. He was like man on earth. He became sin. And now he is exalted with all authority on heaven and earth at the right hand of the Father. He has all authority. The name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. 
By the way, you might remember a character called, I believe it was Todd Bentley. Remember Todd Bentley? Listened to angels and then a whole bunch of stuff. Now, we have a name that's much more excellent than the angels and we have the spirit of that name who is Messiah. We have the Holy Spirit who is apt to speak to us. We don't need necessarily an angel to come and whisper in our ear. We've got to be very careful by which spirit we hear things. That's why the positioning statement is we have him, Jesus, the authority. Things get weird sometimes when you start listening or proclaiming that you're listening to angels or listening to another spirit. Quite often they can be demons. We've got many a faith that has developed from hearing something and then proclaiming as a false prophet, like as a prophet. So Mormonism, for example, or the Jehovah's Witnesses, they have this prophecy that, that seems to follow on but slightly deviates from the Word of God. How do you test prophecy, folks? The Word of God. But how, is there a way you can test it definitively? Definitively, you can test it according to Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 18 as to whether the prophet, who whether they commit signs, miracles and wonders, whether they contradict the Torah. If they stand in alignment with the Torah, then they can be perceived as a true prophet or someone who's prophesying the words of God. But if they contradict, they are a false prophet. This is how you judge whether someone... I've had many a person prophesy and say, the Lord says you need to not do this and it related to one of the commands. Immediately I knew that's not a word from the Lord. That's a word of, it's not necessarily that it's a demon. It can be a word of flesh. Someone's wanting to be encouraging. But this is why, friends, that you need to know. If you want to prophesy, you need to know the Torah, not just, not, not just as a bit of knowledge, but you, that you're hearing the voice of the Lord. Well, I think this is a good place to pull up because we have a whole bunch more to go and I'm going to do one of two things. I'm either going to bore you if I keep going along this line and, and, and you're going to be overwhelmed with a few things. How are you feeling? Are you comfortable? You good? Helen, you good? Why don't we pray? Why don't we pray? I, I think this is a great journey for us in the book of Hebrews, folks. And this first couple of chapters is really a positioning, uh, you know, it's, it's setting the foundations of how we interpret and understand the rest of the book. But then we're going to get into some really meaty conversations, okay, some really, some things that, I think we're going to destroy a couple of sacred cows and, or at least put them up there to investigate and say, do we, do we want to have this one or do we not want to have this one? So you good with that? Father, I thank you. Just join and pray with me for a moment. Thank you, Lord. Father, we love coming around your word. We love the power of your Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray that as each of us go on this journey of understanding the book of Hebrews, that you help by your spirit and by the words we read, give us an understanding of how this book was meant to be interpreted. Lord, we honor you and we love you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen.